appreciate it. All right. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for those of you who are joining us on the live stream. We'll get started in just a few minutes, uh, right at six o'clock. Good, are you? Hi, yes. Yeah.
Hi, everyone. I'm going to get started. Hi, folks. I'm Thanks for being here. Promotion in the lobby. It's always a good thing. Okay. How is everyone doing? Long time no see. Those of you who join us every time, thank you so much for being here. We are um, here tonight for the second lecture in our 2023. That year still sounds weird. 2023 um, plugged into energy research lecture series. We're getting a little snazzier with the titles these days. Um, tonight's lecture is, is the price right? Embracing energy efficiency in the real estate market. Um, <clears throat> we're proud of this one. And I, I, I'm just gonna set up our speakers and say, you know, I think um, this is an important topic and something we're hoping we can do some more work to shore up in Rhode Island and beyond. It feels like um, the intersection of the change in hands of, of real estate and new construction and energy efficiency just really go hand in hand. And so we have three wonderful speakers, two who are here live in the flesh um, with our moderator, Toby, and then um, Hannah is joining us on Zoom. So, I just want to share a couple things quickly, and then I'm going to welcome our um, 2023 Energy Literacy Fellow to the podium. Um, first thing is, we are uh, part of what's called Cooperative Extension here at URI. Is anyone familiar? Very familiar somewhat familiar with cooperative extension. So in, um, in other states, cooperative extension tends to be pretty well known um, if they have a big agricultural economy. Of course, in Rhode Island, we have a pretty disturbed landscape and not a lot of land. And so extension in Rhode Island is neat because we work, we're able to actually work in a lot of different areas outside of the food system and agriculture and this energy literacy initiative that Caitlin and I um, work together on here at URI is kind of unique. Um, and just in a word, um, extension exists to bring the science-based resources of the land grant system out to the public. So, you know, a hundred years ago, that took the form of, you know, the best um, corn variety, making sure farmers had that, had access to that or, or um, access to information about keeping their machinery um, working if they couldn't come to university for a liberal arts education. These days, um, we tend to latch on to critical issues around energy and food and water and land, you know, all the important things. And so um, our programs exist to make sure that you all have a conduit to the um, research enterprise at the university. We're really proud of that. So um, thank you for being here with us. And if um, there's anyone in your life who you think could benefit from having more science, hook us up with them um, because we're here to serve everyone and some folks are harder to reach than others. So we appreciate you connecting us wherever you can. Um, and just a couple housekeeping items. So we will send you a link to a post lecture survey. And we love you so much if you fill that out. Um, every one of these lectures gets better every time and every year because we sit and and kind of digest the information we gather from people, the good and the bad, the constructive um, and otherwise. So thank you for sharing your thoughts about new topics that you think we should cover or um, speakers we should definitely have back, things like that. So you'll get that in an email after. Um, and finally, this is being recorded. We're also live streaming on YouTube, very hip. So um, probably within the week, we will post a recording for this lecture. So if anyone would like to share it, 
with um, appraisers or realtors or policymakers that may not be here or on the live stream, that also would be great. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you work in the energy sector in a professional capacity? Okay, for the folks at home, that's quarter of the room. How many students? All right. Uh, how many concerned citizens? Amen. Great. Um, anyone expecting a different topic? <laughs> no? Okay, great. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to welcome up Lexi Zabo, who is our, um, as I said, energy fellow for our energy literacy team this year. Um, she's an undergraduate studying environmental and natural resource economics, originally from Exeter, and it's been a pleasure working with her. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I am the 2023 Energy Literacy Fellow for URI Cooperative Extension. I'd like to begin by taking a moment by thanking our Energy Fellow sponsors for 2023. Our kilowatt sponsor is Vineyard Wind and our megawatt sponsor is Rise Engineering. Their continued support for the Energy Fellows does not go unnoticed as they provide us with many networking and professional development opportunities. And if you are interested in learning about sponsoring the Energy Fellows program or this lecture series, please see Kate or Kaylin after the lecture. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Toby Ast is a project manager at Rhode Island Energy, where he is responsible for program planning and policy development with a focus on the annual energy efficiency plans. Prior to Rhode Island Energy, he worked for a decade on implementing energy efficiency for multifamily housing with a focus on affordable housing. He's excited about the opportunity to work on initiatives to advance Rhode Island's decarbonization goals. Please welcome Toby Ast. Thank you, Lexi. Um, and I want to thank uh, Kate and Kayla too for inviting me to host this panel. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to note that today, October 4th is uh, Energy Efficiency Day. Um, so I hope that everyone got a LED bulb in their thermally insulated stocking this morning. Um, and uh, my wife told me not to tell that joke. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's uh, great to be here. Um, I've seen these uh, presentations. Uh, there's tons of really interesting information, and I think you're going to enjoy all of the presentations. Um, so let me start by introducing uh, John Balth, who is the Senior Manage Manager of State and Community Solutions at the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, also known as NEEP. Uh, in this role, he helps drive decarbonization programs in new and existing residential and commercial buildings throughout the region. Uh, John engages with a variety of industry stakeholders to advance public policy, pilot projects, and programs that lead to a clean energy future for all. A lot of P's in that. So, yes. all right, welcome, John. Welcome, John. All right, hello, everybody. My name is John Boff, senior manager on the State and Community Solutions team at NEEP. I'll talk a little bit more about who we are in a moment. Um, Thanks to the URI team for having me here tonight. Really excited to be talking with you all. Let's see, so I'm gonna be uh, teeing up the conversation, talking a little bit about home energy labeling, um, giving kind of a primer into what is home energy labeling, what's happening in the Northeast uh, related to these initiatives. You know, what can we expect to see more of in the future? Um, so that's, yeah, a little bit of what I'll cover, you know, some of the, the benefits uh, of, of home energy labeling programs. Um, yeah, and where it's happening so far. So NEEP, has anybody, any folks out there heard of NEEP before? Couple? All right. That's more than I expected, actually. So that's good. Um, so NEEP is Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, regional nonprofit that works from Maine uh, down to West Virginia. So pretty broad geographical area. Uh, we work on a variety of different initiatives. Um, you know, largely what my team is involved with is state and local government kind of policy and program uh, related activities. Uh, 
partnerships is in our name. So collaboration is really core to what we do. We love to bring folks together. Uh, we have tons of working group meetings and webinars where folks from Maine can be sharing information with folks from Rhode Island or from West Virginia. So we're really trying to not reinvent the wheel, learn from the best practices and um, you know lessons learned uh, on, on various energy related topics. Uh, but that's a lot of, of what we do. Um, my team is involved in uh, things on the commercial uh, benchmarking side of things, as well as uh, building performance standards. We're also involved on the residential side of things on what I'll be talking about tonight, labeling, as well as whole home retrofit programs. Uh, and we really just want to see the market, you know, more, more of these things happening in the market. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we work from Maine down to West Virginia, and there's a, a pretty broad uh, number of goals uh, across all of these different states and across you know some of the municipalities within these states as well. Uh, so this just gives you a sense of the things that we are working towards. Um, and you know the, the point here being that there's a lot of different goals and uh, residential energy labeling is really one of those uh, policy drivers or one of those tools within the toolkit that will help get us to achieve our goals across the region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's start with some of the basics of home energy labeling. Maybe before I do that, have folks, anybody here actually gotten a label for their home in the past? Or how about an assessment through the utility program? A few folks, okay, great. Um, so I want to make the differentiation here that, you know, home energy label is really an output of an assessment that you would get on your home. Uh, so an energy audit might uh, result in a home energy label. Uh, not always, but uh, it, it might. A home energy labeling program is sort of a broader policy or program that a state or a local government would develop and implement uh, really ultimately to drive more home energy retrofits or to drive information into the real estate transaction process. Um, so a home energy label, you know, is, is an output of assessment of a home's energy performance. The labeling program is that broader initiative that a state or local government might, uh, might implement. Um, it's really used for getting the hands into, uh, getting information into the hands of homeowners or prospective home buyers. Uh, so it can uh, it can be signaled or passed to a prospective home buyer during the real estate transaction process. Some jurisdictions require that to be done. So if you are putting your home up for sale, uh, you might have to insert a home energy label into that process. Uh, and I'll show an example of that shortly. Um, it can also just be something that a homeowner does. They can go out and get uh, a label through uh, a rater, an auditor, um, and just use that information to kind of guide their home energy upgrades over time. Uh, that's another option. Um, and then lastly, a jurisdiction uh, might implement a program because they're interested in driving those actions in homes and also using that information uh, more broadly for their entire building uh, portfolio. So it gives them a lot of information as to how their how the homes in their jurisdiction are uh, are performing, and maybe how to tailor additional programs or market uh, market programs towards homeowners in a better way. So it's really kind of an information gathering and um, you know way for homeowners in states and municipalities to kind of drive forward on energy efficiency. Uh, there's a couple of different, well, actually, there's a, several different types of labels out there. A lot of them either fall in the category of operational or asset ratings. Uh, so they can look specifically at the physical components of a building, the insulation, the HVAC system, the windows, and that would drive kind of the, the asset rating. Uh, and then the operational rating is more based on the occupants and, and how energy and systems are used within that building. Um, so those are two of the primary types that might make up a, a label. Um, and who creates the label? It can be a variety of different stakeholders. Uh, it can be an auditor or a rater, as I mentioned. It could be the homeowner, actually. There's a lot of new tools out there that allow um, homeowners themselves to go through the energy uh, label uh, process. There's you know cool new uh, softwares and apps that you can use and just go around your home using an app to develop an energy label. Uh, there, or you might you know, go through a contractor as well. That might be uh, a home performance contractor that would you know, actually take on the retrofit projects as well. 
Um, and then lastly, you know, through energy uh, utility programs as well. So what are some of the reasons that we would see a state or a local government creating a home energy labeling program? You know, one of those is just a really inefficient older housing stock. You know, I think in the Northeast, we're really, uh, uh, you know, our, our buildings are largely here. They've been around for a while. They might predate some energy codes um, and they might be, you know, perfect candidates for home energy upgrades. So that older outdated housing stock is one of the drivers of these types of programs. Higher energy burden. So uh, folks that live in, in homes or rent homes that pay a higher percentage of their income uh, to energy, you know, they have high energy burdens. Um, those folks, we, we want to, um, you know, implement these programs to reduce their utility costs over time. Uh, consumer awareness and protection, I think that's, you know, part of what this discussion is about here tonight. Um, you know, this information can be integrated into the real estate transaction process so that a home buyer looking at a home can better understand what their utility costs would be over time and how, how the systems operate in, in a um, home that they might be looking at. And then ultimately, you know, probably the, the number one driver of home energy labeling programs is really to drive retrofits, to drive improvements, you know, ultimately to our building stock over time. So here's just a quick snapshot, and this is a map that I borrowed from NASIO, which is the National Association of State Energy Officials, um, that gives you a good picture of where these types of programs are happening across the country. Uh, and I'll say that, you know, this map is probably regularly uh, updated, uh, but I'm not sure it captures everything that's happening across the country because these, these policies are uh, being updated on a regular basis. Um, so you'll see there's a few here in the Northeast, uh, one in particular in Vermont that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but yeah, these are, you know, a few of the exciting policies we see across the country. Uh, and I think these slides will be shared. So if you're really interested in taking a closer look at who's doing what, um, you'll be able to do that. You know, I think one of the interesting things to note on this slide is just the, uh, you know, the trigger points of these, uh, of these programs is, you know, really different across the country. So it can be time of sale, time of listing. Um, if it's a rental property, it can be time of, um, you know, when that, that property goes on the, the rental market. Um, you know, it could be as simple as an energy bill disclosure, or it could be more complex that uh, a homeowner would have to get an energy label, get a professional auditor, come out, get that label, and then disclose that in a real estate transaction. So there's a wide variety of these policies and programs out there across the country. One in particular uh, that I'll highlight here is in the state of Vermont. Uh, so a few years ago, um, they started working with the state and various other stakeholders, uh, the efficiency program up there um, and the city of Montpelier on the development of a, a statewide residential labeling program. And the state decided to uh, develop a new tool and an online platform called the Vermont Home Energy Profile uh, that would be used for the statewide program. Currently, it is done on a voluntary basis across the state. So any, any uh, home owner that wants to go through the label development process can go on to the Vermont Home Energy Profile, develop a label for their home, and then share with any prospective home buyers as they go through the process. It is mandatory in Montpelier uh, to do so. So if you're a homeowner in Montpelier, putting your home up for sale, you actually are uh, required to go through this process and disclose that information to uh, any potential home, home buyers. And I'll show you an example of what that home energy profile looks like in a moment here. Um, so we're seeing some results come in from these programs across the country and still probably a lot to uh, a lot to kind of dig through in the future here as a lot of these programs are newer. Um, you know, I think one of the main sort of arguments we hear against a program like this is that it could potentially stall real estate transactions. Um, you know, I think that's a common one that folks in the real estate market might uh, might share. Um, but in some studies that have been done, we have seen that not actually to be the case. Um, and you know, as you can see on the slide here, 62% of buyers in some of the Oregon cities where these programs are have used the home energy score information uh, to consider you know, what homes to invest in. Anecdotally, I think in Montpelier, we're seeing you know, the same number of homes being sold on an annual basis 
even with this program being on a mandatory uh, basis. Um, and, you know, re recently the uh, National Association of Realtors um, has shown some in some interest in uh, in this this work, this home energy labeling work. So it's exciting to see, I think, more and more people kind of come on board with this and agents being able to put this information to use um, and, and, you know, sharing it with their prospective home buyers. A few examples of labels that um, that you may see uh, across the country. Uh, this one on the left-hand side of the screen is the Vermont Home Energy Profile. You know, I think these labels can look different uh, depending on the jurisdiction that you're in, uh, but generally have some uh, some key information in it. Uh, and that might be the annual expected energy costs that you can see there. Um, they might have some sort of metric, some sort of number that allows you to easily compare your home's energy use to other similar uh, square footage or similar homes of a similar vintage. Um, and then they generally provide some recommendations too. So what what types of upgrades um, is are right for your home? Uh, how can you expect to uh, reduce your energy consumption over time? Um, so again, these programs come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Uh, municipalities and state governments, you know, spend a lot of time trying to think through how to set up these labels for their their jurisdiction. Uh, but ultimately, they're all sort of working in the same direction of upgrading homes, retrofitting homes providing homeowners with more information about how, how their homes use energy. So just a few thoughts here as I wrap up. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, when it comes to home energy labeling programs, um, partially due to the, uh, the funding that is coming through the federal government, through the Inflation Reduction Act, through the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's a lot of upgrades that will be happening, you know, over the course of time here. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a need to verify that retrofits are happening in homes and the generation of a label is one way to do that. Um, so I think we'll increase, we'll see an increase uh, in labeling programs, you know, for that reason, uh, we'll see it. Uh, going back to my early slide on the goals that states have, they want ways to measure uh, measure their programs, measure home energy upgrades. Again, labeling is another way to do that. Um, you know, I think we're going to see more and more virtual assessments happening. Uh, it's an easy way uh, for contractors to get more information about the homes that they could be working with. It's uh, something that a homeowner can do at any time of the day. Um, they don't have to set up an appointment for an in home audit. So I think that's another area that we'll see a lot of growth in. And then lastly, workforce development. A lot of federal funding coming to developing this workforce, some graders and auditors. Uh, it's a good you know, job opportunity for young folks entering the industry or for folks changing industries. Um, so I think that's you know another area to, to look out for. And with that, uh, so that's kind of sort of the primer of the home energy labeling world, uh, especially in the, the Northeast. Um, my name is John Goff again, and that's my contact information. If folks have any questions, I'll be around for the Q&A as well. So thank you. All right, this is the high tech portion of the evening. Um, so There we go. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Hannah Bastian, um, who is a research analyst uh, contributing to Guidehouse Insights Built Environment Research Service. Uh, her research focuses on global market analysis and forecasts for energy efficiency building technologies. Prior to joining Guidehouse Insights, she was a senior research analyst for the buildings program at the American Council for, for an Energy Efficient Economy also known as ACAAA, there's lots of acronyms in this business, and intern at the Energy Efficiency Center at the University of California, Davis. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me and see me? Yes. Uh, we can hear you too. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, Hannah, you can pull up your slides. Hi, can you see my slides? Yep, they're up. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. 
So uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Hannah Bashan. I'm a research analyst at Guidehouse. And I'm going to be presenting some findings from actually some research I did when I was at BCEEE, uh, specifically on the impact that uh, energy labels can have on renters' decision making. There we go. So like I said, this is some research that I did when I was at ECEEE, so I want to give them all the credit for getting funding for this research and really kind of moving it forward because I think it's been really helpful for the industry. Um, I also want to shout out my co-lead author, Ruben Sussman, who is still the director of human behavior, behavior and human dimensions at ECEEE. And then we also had a broader team of people that I want to say thank you to as well for this um, that were really instrumental for getting this research done. So I'll thank Stephen, Emma, Elizabeth, Ong, and Shiva for also helping. I've also included a link to the research. So if you find my presentation interesting and you want to learn more about the nitty gritty of what we did, and you know, I'm sharing some high level findings, but I think there's a lot more to be learned uh, from what we did. So I highly encourage you to look into the report after uh, this is all over. So what we did is we wanted to create a controlled experiment to test uh, people's behavior, specifically renters' behavior, and whether see if seeing energy labels would affect their decision making when looking for a new home. So what we, um, you know, what we devised as our three main questions that we wanted to answer was: Do renters choose more efficient uh, rental listings when the listings contain energy information? which labels are the most effective, and then which renters value energy efficiency the most. So what we did is we created a mock rental listing website. We called our website Rent Dragon, and we really modeled it after like Zillow, Apartment Finder, those kind of like common websites that people go to online to look for rental listings. And we um, essentially grouped our participants into different groups. And each of those groups saw a different label. So on the right hand side, you can see all the different labels that we tested on our website. Um, and then we had one control group that did not see any energy costs. So that's very much like if you went to a website today to look for a rental, um, you're not going to probably see very much energy information. And so then what we did is, you know, each participant saw one of these labels. And depending on what apartments they chose, we could compare that back to the control group and see, did they pick more efficient labels? Did they stay away from least efficient rental properties that were listed? Um, and if they were willing to increase their rent for a more efficient um, property. So just to give you an idea of what it looked like, here was our website. So participants would see this, they would type in what city or state they lived in. And then they could also add in like their neighborhood if they wanted to. And they would click next. And then they would put in their expected rent. So basically this is what their monthly budget would be for a rental property. They'd pick between if they wanted an apartment or a house. And then they could also put in their preferred number of bedroom. And so then they would see a set of three choices. So just looking at the three choices on the left, um, they would see these three and we would ask them to pick one of these. And as you can see, we varied the different attributes of the listings. So two of these listings have two bedrooms. One has a third bedroom. We varied the rent prices a bit. We varied the, the square footage and also the bathrooms. So basically by varying all those different attributes, we could see, okay, so they picked this one. Maybe they care more about rent price. Or maybe they care more about having that extra bedroom. Um, and this right here is the control group. So they didn't see any energy information. But if they were in a group that did see an energy label, it would look like these are two examples of like the six different labels we tested. But the first one is the monthly energy bills would be listed or another group would see the monthly energy bills on a spectrum. So they could see this is the lowest bill in your area. This is the highest bill in your area. And this is where this rental falls. And so by doing this, we were able to answer the first question. Do renters choose more efficient rental listings when it contains energy and energy efficiency information? And we found that yes, they do. We found that the compared to the control group, participants that saw energy information clicked on efficient listings 21% more often, clicked on least efficient listings 21% less often. And they were also willing to increase their rent by almost 
for a one point increase in energy efficiency. So that is all just to say that, you know, this experiment goes to show that if you give renters this information when they're looking for listings, they actually really will take that into account and they value it. And they also value energy efficiency. So there is, you know, a value in this market for um, a higher performing rental. The next thing we wanted to test was just which labels were most effective. So we did find that all of the labels that we tested were effective, except for the voluntary label. So the voluntary label was kind of an ENERGY STAR certified building, and it was only the most efficient buildings that had the label. So we found that when not all of the buildings have labels, then it's not always as effective as when every building is labeled. Um, we also just found that in general, the labels with more context information were more effective. So for example, this one that was the most effective is just uh, like X out of 10. So those people would know kind of where it ranks uh, in relation to what the scale is. So if you say this is ranked a four, that means less than if this is ranked a four out of 10. Um, and as you can see, as the effectiveness goes down, you have less context to really compare everything. And then the last thing that we kind of learned was just that labels really need to be intuitive. So someone like who doesn't know anything about energy efficiency can look at this and know, okay, a four out of 10, that's probably not very good. Or a nine out of 10, that's actually probably pretty good. And so I think it's really important that labels have context and that they are intuitive. And then we also just looked at which renters valued energy labels the most. We found that uh, renters in the Midwest and Northeast seem to value it the most. People in the West valued it the least. Um, as far as climate, those in the hottest and coolest climate seem to value it the most. And, you know, we can speculate that it's probably because maybe they have higher heating or cooling costs. So energy is energy efficiency is more important to them because um, it could mean a really big impact on their monthly budget. Um, it could also be that maybe they associate that with an energy efficient building with something that's more comfortable. It's probably less leaky. It probably keeps you more warm or cool in the summer or the winter. Um, but this is all just to say with like an asterisk, like we did not test that. We didn't interview them or ask them about that. So we don't know for sure. This could just be like a seed for a future uh, research report, uh, looking more into why that, why these phenomenons are happening. We also found that apartment renters seem to um, value energy efficiency a little bit more than uh, home renters. So just kind of to wrap that up and like, you know, the takeaways that we would probably recommend to policymakers based off of this is that you should require disclosure at the time of lifting. Um, you know, in the earlier presentation, they talked about you can do it at different times um, of this process, but we found that if you do it on the listing website and you give them that information earlier when they're still shopping around, it can really influence kind of the decisions that they are making. Um, it influences what properties they click on that might influence which properties they actually go see. And so I think the earlier you can get this information to people, the better. I think it's also important that we use a multi-policy approach for this. I mean, while we found that it does increase click-through rates to more efficient properties and renters are maybe willing to increase their rent a bit, it's probably not going to move the needle dramatically. And so I think that this has to be one part of a broader um, initiative to make rental housing more efficient. And I also think that there's an important context around affordable housing that you want to consider as well. You know, if renters are willing to increase their rent for a more efficient unit, that can still have some implications for how affordable housing is. So I think we want to be really careful with protecting the affordability of our housing, um, even as we pursue making things more efficient or higher performance. Um, I think, again, what's something we would recommend to policymakers is use like a context-rich label. So giving people a lot of context to anchor kind of where to really understand like what they're reading and what they're learning. Um, and I think if they can move away from volunteering and go into a mandatory policy. However, I think it's also important to recognize that these policies can be sometimes hard to pass and move along and implement. And so if a voluntary policy is all that you can do, I think that there's still value in do a voluntary uh, policy. 
And then, of course, use an intuitive rating system. So we use the, um, the DOE's home energy score and building asset score. And so, you know, DOE's put a lot of time and money and um, effort into creating these labels that can communicate energy information just to the everyday person. And so I think if you're going to, you know, pursue a policy, it's really good to use um, an intuitive rating system and lean on the ones that have already done this and have already been through the process and have developed like a very strong, you know, um, user experience, I guess. And then the last one is maybe engaging apartment renters since they seem to value energy efficiency slightly more than home renters. Um, so I'll pause there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. All okay. right. Okay. All right. Um, final speaker for the evening, uh, Jennifer Hawkins. Uh, she's the president and CEO of One Day Rock Builders um, and has more than 20 years of experience in the nonprofit community development and housing sectors. Uh, Jennifer has worked in senior management positions and as a member of the board of director for organizations that tackle the most pressing housing and community health issues. Uh, she understands how to navigate an environment with unrelenting demand for scarce resources, motivate a talented team to generate high impact and improve the health and equity of communities. So please welcome Jennifer. Good evening. Thank you, Toby. Um, and John and him, it's uh, wonderful to be on stage, virtual stage and otherwise with you. Um, and thank you and URI for inviting me to kind of speak with you tonight. Um, so I'm gonna launch right into it. So one, Neighborhood Builders. We are a little bit of an odd uh, person out here uh, compared to the other panelists. I don't uh, live and breathe energy actually. Um, I've kind of come at this from a, a different angle. So housing is a space that I know very intimately. Um, so our mission is uh, we're a community development leader in Rhode Island that aims to build vibrant, safe, and healthy communities. And to date, we've uh, developed 466 affordable homes. Uh, most of those are rental apartments and some of our um, home ownership opportunities for our first generation uh, affordable buyers. So I'm going to walk through a case study that we produced on a project called Shared in Small Homes um, and then sort of use that as a deep dive into why we think there really is a significant opportunity to combine affordable housing and energy efficiency. And then I want to have a kind of a zoom out and talk about the challenges and um, opportunities for bringing sort of this work to scale. So we, one of our builders predominantly works in the city of Providence, um, although we have recently expanded our footprint to work in Central Falls and uh, East Providence and Cumberland. Uh, so we mostly work in the urban core um, and have most of our history, we've worked in areas that have environmental um, blight, a lot of brownfield remediation, um, old homes that were vacant for a number of years, were blighted, foreclosed upon, and needed to be um, completely gutted and rehabbed. Um, and as the, the prior uh, John had mentioned, you know, the Rhode Island is definitely characterized as having extremely old housing. Uh, so that's just a little bit of a context of where we where we do our work. Um, a few years ago, it, it sort of occurred to me that we could still just keep doing what we've always been doing, which is 
um, building housing with oil, with fossil fuels, with natural gas, um, with materials that, you know, um, not trying to be mindful of reducing waste that bring go to landfills. And there's a lot of pressure to do just sort of business as usual. There's a lot of pressure to have to contain costs of how can you drive down the cost of construction to as many units as possible. Um, and I just felt like that really doesn't make sense in communities that have shouldered the burden of environmental injustice for so long that are disproportionately affected by uh, climate change and asthma rates and so forth that we really need to do better specifically for low-income households and really, I think, raise the bar for affordable housing. So we made a commitment that all of our housing will be all electric. Um, and that we will do our very best to incorporate um, sustainable infrastructure. So having all of our buildings be solar ready and wherever possible have electric um, car charging stations. Um, and when I say solar ready, meaning um, if we're able to get subsequent funding uh, through incentives or grants to then put the solar, we're ready to go. Um, it's sort of hard to retrofit. It's way easier if you kind of build that in from the very beginning in your design. So this is the case study, um, which is uh, called Shared Small Homes. So um, this project is in the Onlyville neighborhood of Providence. Um, Onlyville neighborhood is right on the Wenasa Kentucky River. It's prone to flooding. Um, it is um, a community that has a lot of assets, but has a lot of challenges. About 42% of the residents are below the poverty line. Um, and this area of land that we purchased had just for a long time been a dumping ground. Um, and it was certainly a brownfield. So uh, we really wanted to demonstrate that people want to live in community, that they want to live in more modest uh, sized homes and in, in close clustered nature. So on three quarters of an uh, acre of land, we built five homes that were each 725 square feet, um, two bedroom, one and a half bath. Um, so really small, modest sized homes, closely clustered together, but very uh, well designed. It was designed by a RISD um, class and, and an architect so really high volume and a sense of, of airiness. Um, so these homes here were um, designed from the get-go of being um, zero energy and passive house certifiable. Um, it's, they didn't quite become certified for a variety of reasons, which I'll get to, but um, they were designed to meet those standards. So. The um, siting of the homes had to be such that they were located in a place to maximize solar gain in the winter and sort of have the, the, the sun and the shadow for the summer so it's cooling um, in the heat, uh, the hot months. Um, and we, uh, the foundation, I think this might, yeah. I'll just skip around here for a second. But the foundation was a slab on grade. Um, so we did, uh, it's actually a shallow footing foundation. So that really allowed you to kind of take advantage of the thermal heat of the ground. Um, the envelope was extremely tight. Um, so we had extra um, uh, insulation, super insulation uh, with a continuous air barrier. The windows were triple pane. Um, those were probably the most expensive item in the construction. Um, we had to import them from Poland. Um, it's very hard to find triple pane windows manufactured um, locally. And when I say locally, I mean in, in America. Um, maybe this has changed. We constructed this home um, in 2020 during COVID. Um, so really, um, the other part of the, the windows here, they were just really large, beautiful windows. Um, we prefer to have a few big ones rather than a lot of small ones, again, for the um, having that continuous air barrier. Um, we, of course, had solar. So in the south-facing buildings, as mentioned, um, we're connected to the solar panels. So these five homes um, are condominiums. 
And we decided um, when doing this that we would have one meter that connected all of the solar panels um, as opposed to having each of the homes have a different meter for the solar. The reason for that is that the um, energy that's generated from the panels reduces the homeowner's condominium fees and we wanted it to be equitable. So potentially one home could generate more revenue from their panels than another home and they would have more of a discount in their condominium fee and we didn't think that was fair. So we aggregate the revenue generated from the five homes uh, solar panels and then equally discount their condominium fees. So in, in effect, none of, no one pays a condominium fee uh, because in fact, they even have a credit on their account because of the amount of solar that's being generated. So um, I'm gonna skip to the interior energy. Um, efficient strategies that we deployed. So I talked a little bit about the, the exterior. Um, and I would say that when we were trying to find the windows, we were trying to find the rigid foam insulation, this is not my world, um, it was very hard. So I think that the industry is maybe catching up quite rapidly, but they're really the ability to find products that met the specs. Uh, required was is is more complicated than we ever predicted. Um, so here are some of the the interior energy strategies we have. Um, obviously, the mini split system, the ductless um, heating and cooling. Uh, we we did find that um, the BTUs at nine thousand. Originally, we had a spec for even less, and we had to increase it. Um, we have the ERVs to constantly circulate the air because it is so tight that if you don't do that, you've got a problem. So you actually have to intentionally circulate the air. Um, so we have space saving, the um, standard um, 30, space saving 94% efficient, 38 gallon standard electric resistant water heater to fit the budget. I actually don't know what that sentence means, <laughs> but hopefully those in the room do. Um, and then of course we had all electric uh, lighting appliances. So this part I very much uh, understand and um, I wanna highlight because I think that when we talk about energy efficient housing and talk about how important it is, it's easy to sort of um, gloss over the challenges associated with doing this. And I, and I don't want to do that because I think that people need to be um, clear eyed about what it takes um, so that we can also rectify it, make it easier for our future projects. So on the, on the plus side though, um, these were exceptionally high quality homes. Um, to be able to purchase a home as a low income buyer for $145,000, a passive house, zero energy home, two bed, one and a half bath, gorgeous home right in the park. And I mean, that's amazing. And so to be able to give that to first generation low income buyers is, is, was something that we're quite proud of. Uh, we really contributed to the city's climate goals. There was a training opportunity for the construction uh, pre-apprentices. So many of the people who were working on the project had never utilized the products that we had spec'd. And they were not accustomed to the, um, the number of inspections that were required. So we used clear results and they were constantly coming and inspecting during various phases of the construction to make sure that we were meeting benchmarks. There was any number of lower door tests that were conducted. So that was a really great training opportunity. Um, and then I think that we really proved that an energy efficient, affordable home is possible. That really is the, the, the biggest piece here, that so many people create this dichotomy of either it can be energy efficient or it can be home or it can be affordable, but it can't be both. And we really wanted to prove that wrong, that not only can it be both, but we actually have an obligation to do both. So on the, the bad side, I would say that, as I mentioned, the challenge with obtaining materials, the higher level of inspections and testing, it really slowed the process up quite considerably because you had to line up all these, you know, wait, stop doing the foundation, the, you know, foundation, they've got to come inspect it. No, wait, got to come inspect it. So that really was something we didn't anticipate. 
the learning curve for the subcontractors. Um, in fact, we had to sometimes do work over because they failed the lower door test and it's because the subcontractor really didn't know how to use a material. Um, and once it was constructed, we had, you know, a variety of like the, the ERVs and the mini splits. The homeowners were really not accustomed to setting it and forgetting it. And that is so essential when you have these mini split systems. You can't be constantly fluctuating the heating and cooling. Um, you really shouldn't open the windows. You really, it just means that's a very different way of kind of interacting with your home. Um, and we did not anticipate needing to really teach people how to use their homes and how to use the, um, the systems. And then some of the ugly. So we wanted to pull up all of the concrete and have a pervious uh, surface. So we have gravel, which is, is great in theory. But then when the snow comes and the snow plowing blows everything and it's muddy and terrible. So I think that we um, would love to be able to use less um, paving and less impervious surfaces when we do our building, our parking lots and so forth. But I think we need to get better on how we handle using crushed gravel. And, and so it's just a, it's a learning that we didn't, I don't think we put enough thoughtfulness into that. Um, our mini split was originally undersized, as I mentioned. I think it was spec to like 6,000. It was like that was far too low. So we had to replace them all because our homeowners are complaining that they were cold. That's the other thing, I think, actually, that the, the mini splits, when it's very, very cold, sometimes it's hard to get warm enough. And um, so I do think that that is just a general issue with that product that I think this, the, the field has to reckon with. Um, and then the long delay in connecting solar to the grid. And I think I have some friends from Rhode Island Energy here. Sorry, guys, but it was long. Um, so I think how do we ramp up the connection time? Because, I mean, it, it was like over a year between um, having it constructed and actually being able to plug into the grid. So I think that's something that the industry has to reckon with. So here's our beautiful home, and here's one of our owners. Um, it's it's quite lovely. Um, so some lessons learned for future development. I think we need to simplify the design. I think we can look at maybe doing modular construction. Um, and then really consider the costs and benefits of seeking certification. So as mentioned, we were planning on uh, becoming uh, certified as a uh, passive house certified with bias. Um, we didn't end up getting the certification, although we were about to do that. Uh, but the, the the costs associated with it and the extra certification, it just, we no longer found a particular value in it. So being able to say that we matched the criteria without actually having the paperwork suffice for us. And so it's something to kind of consider, like, what is the cost benefit analysis of going to that final step and becoming certified? So zooming out a little bit for um, the kind of challenges and opportunities for building energy efficiency. Um, I do think, and I was, I was speaking to Toby about this before we got started, that we need, he actually used the term concierge, which I love. I was saying an aggregator, which concierge is far better. Uh, but something, someone who can take and distill all of these sources that are coming down the pike and put it into common accessible language and connect those opportunities with um, state, city agencies and organizations who can actually utilize the resources. There's just so much, and especially if it's not something that you do on your daily basis, if it's sort of a side effort, Boning up on all those resources is just not going to happen. So I think having a, a concierge to provide those resources and technical assistance, I think, would be a huge benefit. The funding sources generally, like as I mentioned, require analysis that a layperson cannot answer. So we are shared in small homes benefited from ZEOS. It's a zero energy ocean state program. There's a, some flyers back there um, advertising that program, which was great. 
it, there's a capital source that we use to construct the homes and it, we needed that. Um, but the ZEOS money requires a considerable amount of reporting that I think could be simplified so that we could do it. Instead, we have to hire someone else to do it. Um, and I think that there could be a, a better way of being able to track outcomes to make this funding more accessible and uh, exciting for people. So the amount of energy is generated, amount of energy consumed, and amount of fossil fuel avoided, those are questions that my staff can't answer, and we need to hire a third party to do that analysis. And I don't know if that's necessary. I think we can get, we can make that a little bit easier. There are really antiquated rules regarding electric uh, metering and utility allowances. So in the state of Rhode Island, if you want to have one meter for a building that has say 12 apartments in it, and you say, I just wanna have one meter and I'm gonna have solar and I'm gonna pay for everyone's electric. You're actually not allowed to. Rhode Island does not allow that. They say every apartment has to have their own meter. So that's a, that's a, a, a piece of legislation that we're trying to advocate to change. I think it would be a lot easier for organizations like One Neighborhood Builders to, to do our work if we could just master meter and bring on the solar and handle it. Um, and then utility allowances. If um, the housing and urban development, which oversees all of the affordable housing that we develop, um, mandates that we deduct a utility allowance from our household rent. Um, and it's set. It's like, if you're a one bedroom, it's this. If you're a two bedroom, it's this. If you're a three bedroom, it's this. Irrespective of the efficiency of the home. So it de-incentivizes landlords from making any sort of energy upgrade because the benefit is only derived by the tenant and not the property owner. So that is a quite significant problem. And I really am hoping that uh, HUD catches up with having a utility allowance that really takes into um, credit the, the efficiency of the home. And then the last point is it's just constantly shifting landscape and rapid technological obsolescence. It's so you just you finally learn something and then you're like, wait, that's so old, it's no longer being utilized. So again, I think it kind of gets back to that concierge, but having someone who can help us through that. Um, that ends my presentation. Thank you. John, if you want to come up with get Hannah back on the screen and then open it up for some Q&A. Questions? Yes. Oh. Jennifer, you said that the, um, the solar benefit paid for the uh, condo fees. What did that amount to? Just out of curiosity. The condo fees are about oh, $210 a month and times so that, five. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And I should say that in addition to the fact that the solar is really covering the condominium fees, the electric bills are very small because just the efficiency of the homes. So it's it's reduced just by the fact that it's that what spec is really efficient. For John, on, on the map of the, of the United States that you showed for the NEOS map, I think it was, where it showed uh, it was in had the green section of the country. What what was the the the, limit, the factor of whether it showed up on the map or not? Because I was a little bit surprised that it was just northeast and midwest. I'm trying to think which one that was. The it was a 
showing all the policies and programs across the country, or was that the energy? No, I have, actually, it was Hannah. That's right. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Hannah. The, the, the map you showed and it had, you know, the areas were more likely people would look at the efficiency of them. And it only showed uh, it tended to, it was just northeast and midwest. I, I was surprised that we didn't see some in the north northwest. And what you know what uh, what was like the limiting or the you know what drove that? You think? Oh, you're muted. Oh. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so I would say people across the country did just did care about energy efficiency and that map was mostly just showing the ones that cared the most and i don't think there it really wasn't like a dramatic difference between like the midwest and the northeast and then the south and the west um i was just featuring the ones that really cared the most so i would say that it's not that like the rest of the country doesn't care it's just that those seem to be the ones that care the most in this experiment and so it's something to consider in it. And like I said, we can speculate. It might just be that energy bills are higher where there's a lot more cold because heating costs can be really high, especially if you have like oil or propane, which is common in some parts of that country, of the country. So the, we also didn't test for that. So I don't want to say that definitively. That's like kind of what we think might be the driver for that. But um, just in general, that's kind of the trend that we saw. Okay, thank you. So, so John, to, to that, to that, what you talked about policy, Rhode Island wasn't even on there. Who's that? <laughs> yeah, man, we would love to work with Rhode Island on a home energy labeling program. Um, you know, I think there's been interest from the state and some jurisdictions, maybe, uh, or municipalities, I should say. Um, you know, I think it's, it takes a while and it's hard to pass these these types of policies. That's the reality of it. It takes a lot of stakeholder engagement, you know, years of, of uh, conversations with folks. So it's not it's not a simple process, but, you know, there's assistance out there for states and, and municipalities. And, you know, that's part of what we offer is that. I think this question is for you, John, but others can certainly chime in. Uh, as I think about home energy scores and how those can be used, I'm thinking particularly in the example of potential home buyers. Um, how do potential home buyers know the level of rigor that went into a score? Certainly, an example of a, a state that has a policy that requires it. You mentioned, I think, Montpelier specifically has its own uh, policy. So, like, if you're buying within Montpelier, certainly, like, you can understand that other homes in Montpelier are the same, but people certainly buy homes across state lines. So if you have a policy or a program in Vermont and then one in Massachusetts, for example, how can we make sure that potential home buyers know that a home energy score in one of those states is similar or the same or entirely different than one uh, in another state? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think this gets back to the need to really standardize these labels uh, across the country. Um, you know, the more we do that, I think that's something that NEEP is pushing more for rather than creating, you know, in Vermont's case, a customized label, um, you have a nationally recognized, uh, you know, the Department of Energy has what's called the home energy score. That's a nationally recognized label. Um, so having something like that, that can, you know, that has a, a national database behind it, has, um, you know, recognition behind it. I think those are the types of programs we'd like to see more of rather than these custom labels that, you know, are different from one jurisdiction to another. Um, you know, I think the label itself takes into account that jurisdictions, you know, homes and the climate. Um, so it is specific to where it was created for. But again, I think having a, a nationally recognized label, having that, you know, work across the country is beneficial. That's what we would push for. Yeah, question. He works for the states, I know. Okay, I'll go first. Then you, Brett. Um, and Brett works for Rhode Island Energy, so join him under the bus, too. Um, so, my question was for um, uh, one neighborhood builders. I'm kind of hearing this conversation about building energy labeling and that kind of thing. Like, what's your reaction to that and any of the added costs that might add or added, again, sort of added 
processes of the home buying and home selling. Kind of what's your perspective on this conversation? Thank you. Um, I think it would be great to have consistency. I, I was liking it to the walk score where regardless of the community you're living in, there's a objective score across the state lines, right? Um, and I think it would help to drive interest in our properties and to sort of reward publicly those extra steps that we were taking, that commitment to making all of our properties all electric. Um, it's not really clear that that is the case. And so I think that we would um, champion having a requirement that that is the case. And we also just, it, regardless of one neighborhood builders, our, our own um, housing, the fact is that there's so much housing that is of poor quality and the, that contributes to um, chronic health conditions and um you know, even risk of fire and et cetera. So um, I think that in, in, in housing that is in poor uh, condition or is often leased to individuals with the fewest, littlest means, right? So I think that it could be a way also to encourage uh, improvements in home repair and more funding for um, upgrades. There are other questions out there. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm curious on the re realtor angle, John. You had a stand there about 71% of realtors thought this made a difference. My mother in law is a realtor. I'd be su uh, surprised if it's over 50%. I <laughs> care about it. I don't know if you have more stats on that. And then for Hannah, how do you see your exercise kind of influencing or what can real the realtor industry learn from that? And Jennifer, do you work through realtors or do you just work directly with to, to get clients? Yeah, just quickly on, you know, realtor engagement, I think it varies across that industry pretty significantly. You know, we see some kind of early adopters of this, some champions in the real estate sector. Um, there are studies out there that we can point to and you know, love to share them with you, Brett. Um, I think there's still probably a long way to go in the real estate market for uh, convincing people that this information is useful, won't stall home sales. Um, you know, we're trying to work with those that you know that are on kind of the leading edge of this and have that work with their uh local real estate uh, networks and you know share out information but i do think there's you know a perception there that we still need to, to work on changing i agree sorry i keep forgetting to mute myself um, I think that's a great question. We didn't really think about what our results would mean for the real estate community. And I think it's mostly because, you know, we'll engage with the ones that are very interested and, you know, excited about this and want to embrace it. Uh, I think, you know, with my research at ECEEE, a lot of it was mostly focused on policymakers and trying to engage them um, and really encourage them to pursue policies that were mandatory and maybe even push back against the real estate community if they have to uh, to do that. Um, so, I mean, I think the only thing off the top of my mind, if I'm just spitballing off of what could be valuable for the real estate agency is just, um, or the industry would be that, you know, you can command higher rents with this. And so that could mean more income for them. It could, you know, increase the trust that like their, their clients have and the happiness that their clients have of their services if they can command more rent. We actually did the same exact study for home sales. So we found that homes, um, more efficient homes could sell for more. So it could be the same thing. We can get a higher cut of that. Um, so I think, you know, we could, if we wanted to engage the real estate agency, I think maybe we'd lean on those like financial gains that can be had from these kind of um, labeling, especially if you have efficient properties. But I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's like compelling enough to them, frankly. So great question. Um, definitely something to think about. I don't have all the answers for that. Jen. Okay. Oh, all right. Uh, other questions? Uh, using Jennifer's example, the, the 
the assets that you built. And then you, it sounded like you said you were looking at labeling, but you didn't do it. So it was either not cost beneficial or cost prohibitive. So how much does it, I have no idea how much it costs to get one of these labels done. So if you had like a 10,000, uh, sorry, 10,000, I wish, a 2,000 square foot raised ranch, I mean, um, or one of your houses, like what, what are we talking about? So we were um, seeking to receive passive house certification, which um, is a, a level of of green validation above and beyond, I think, the labeling conversation that we're having. Um, and so, you know, passive house is, you could consider it the gold standard um, because anyone could ostensibly achieve zero energy if you have a solar farm, right? If you have enough solar, anyone could get there. Um, but the idea is to become sort of neutral with the least amount of solar generation. And so the way to do that is to have an extremely efficient home um, so that you're able to, to get that zero energy standard. Um, and I'm sure that my co-panelists would describe that better than I just did, but that's my understanding of it. Um, but we did not uh, seek sort of this this labeling exercise, uh, honestly, because I've really been unaware of it. Um, but I, I think I'm interested in learning more since having this conversation. Um, I don't think that in Rhode Island there is a, an existing uh, a consistent labeling system, right? Like Mount Pelier or others. Um, but I, I'm open to doing that in the future. But for the general that's... audience, that's anybody, any three, you know, like what, a regular residential house, like what, if somebody wanted to be proactive and go get a label, how yeah. much, how much does it, yeah, so budget range? Yeah, it, it will depend on the type of label, I guess I'll say that first, you know, there, like I was talking about, there's custom labels, there's the DOE home energy score like DOE. for something like that. You may be looking at a couple hundred to a few hundred dollars. It depends on where you are in the nation. I think in places like Oregon, there are a lot of auditors out doing that. So it's a little bit cheaper there in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, this general area. There may be less auditors out there that are uh, certified to do home energy scores. So a few hundred dollars would be my guess. You're not talking in the thousands. Um, there are other labels out there that might be free to do, but to do that certified home energy score, um, that would be my my rough estimate. Hannah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well. And then one one other item. Don't you think with like Birdo and, and the Boston area, the reporting or the New York local 87, yep. because, you know, don't you think that's going to start to translate over into residential buildings? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think labeling is sort of akin to that. Um, it's, I think, with Birdo, with, so, uh, you know, in, in many cities and now states, they're requiring benchmarking of large commercial buildings. That's what Birdo is, you know, buildings over 20,000 square feet. Um, so the largest energy, you know, consumers in a, in a city. Um, yeah, I think we'll start to see that you know, that threshold come down lower and lower, you know, smaller uh, communities can adopt uh, a program like that. And if they have, you know, only small buildings, they can make it apply to, uh, to single family households. Um, you know, I think that might still be a little ways away, um, but I think we'll see more and more of that. I guess I can add to that. Um, well, for one, I have seen, I think a couple hundred dollars for home energy score is pretty much what it is. Um, I've seen that as well. But then the Boston burrito policy, I think also applies to multifamily building. Um, and I think a lot of the benchmarking policies that are targeting large buildings, uh, commercial buildings are also targeting multifamily buildings. I will point out there's like a little bit of a distinction between those and like the home energy score because those are like a whole building. So you don't really know necessarily what your unit is going to be, like your monthly bill. Um, or, you know, how like specific your unit is. But if you have a general sense for how efficient the building is, I think you can kind of extrapolate how efficient your individual unit is. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that will push the market um, more. 
especially for large multi building. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm David Ruggiero, by the way. I work for the city of Providence. I think I know all of most of you here. Um, it, Providence is ready to adopt a Beardo, they're calling it Biro. I don't know why they dropped the D. It's confusing to me. I've worked in Boston most of my life. Um, so they will be requiring benchmarking for larger buildings, which is the, uh, that will be rolled out next spring. Um, but my question was, while well, I realized this was uh, focused on residential space, what is your experience or could anyone comment on not benchmarking, but labeling in the commercial or the institutional, the municipal space? Is there much traction that you see and how much benefit could there be? Yeah, um, I would say there's more just benchmarking and that's, you know, reporting on energy consumption um, in commercial buildings uh, using EPA's portfolio manager to do so and to get an energy star score. You know, that's kind of akin to a, a label, I suppose. Uh, it's comparing you to other similar buildings, but I guess I don't have a lot of experience on label generation for commercial buildings specifically other, other than through a portfolio manager. Yeah, I, I would add there's a ton of labels out there, different labeling schemes for commercial buildings. Um, and a lot of places have requirements in terms of minimum standards, whether it be, you know, has to be a lead silver building or it has to hit certain performance criteria. Um, and that, you know, that moves the market. I mean, even local law 97, like that was referenced, is based on the Energy Star score of the building and if you're not hitting a certain level they're, they're pretty hefty fines um so that's definitely more of a, of a top-down approach to encouraging efficiency um but uh you spend a lot of money for those labels as well um, so that's a, a, a whole other industry into itself um but i think a lot of commercial building owners have made that calculation that it's worth it either they can command higher rents um, um Building maintenance is a big benefit as well that you see in a lot of these buildings that are built to these standards. They're just easier to maintain, less expensive to maintain. Um, so I think there's a case to be made there as well. But it does sort of tie into a question I had um, for Jen. You know, you spoke very passionately about the reasons that one neighborhood is doing this. If you were to talk to an owner, you know, a for-profit owner doesn't care about anything but the bottom line. What's the case that you make to build a building like Sheridan? Well, we were selling it uh, obviously at a significant discount for an affordable buyer or a low income um, buyer to find it affordable. But if that was not the objective, um, I mean, we could have sold that home for well over $400,000. Um, and I think that there is a premium, and I think that um, Hannah's uh, research does indicate that people want to live in healthy homes that are um, have less of an impact on the environment and are more efficient. So those are, you can sort of monetize those values, and I think that would translate to increased rent or increased sales price. Um, I think that will only increase. I think that people's just consciousness of trying to reduce their carbon footprint is um, something that people are increasingly passionate about. So um, I guess I would argue that, if, you know, hopefully they'll just want to do it because it's the right thing to do. But that that's not also the case, we'll do it because it makes financial sense for them, ultimately. I have a, a question, just mapping something back up. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about, I've owned two homes, had more than one audit done on each. Couldn't believe when I first learned that the utility would pay for 75% of the work that the assessor had identified. And I did everything because I was brought up to find a bargain. 
And my dad said, you only have to pay 25%, Kate, so let's do it. So I've, I've done that. And it strikes me that like, then the next step would be, now I want to get my home labeled. And would, is it feasible, Rhode Island Energy folks, that the, uh, seriously, that the utility might subsidize or whatever the right word is, the cost of building, of labeling the building at the point when someone did 100% of what was suggested. And, and so if that is so, I think then, then the driver become one of the drivers could be when someone wants to put their house into the real estate market, we could say to people, we, I'm an extension person. So it would be something we would communicate. If you're, if you want your home to change hands, you can get an audit done. The utility will pay 75% or, you know, if you're income eligible, hundred um, percent to do this weatherization slash retrofit. And then you can get your home labeled and it'll command a higher price. It seems to me that that's like a very logical step. So no pressure, but I'm going to have Toby and our friend here. Just wondering about yeah, no problem. Thanks. That's a great idea. We have talked to companies that do this type of labeling about that potential. I think we have to work with the state to figure out exactly how it will work, but I, I can see that down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Give us like a week. <laughs> yeah. All right, Stephen. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kaylin, one of the organizers. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm. I we did. Can I just ask? Is anybody here in the real estate community? Doing real estate crazy. Thank you for being here. Um, we did get a comment um, from Kate De Simone, who is with Williams and Stewart Real Estate. So I just wanted to read out her comment because um, she was excited to come but couldn't be here, and maybe she's on live stream or uh, listening later. Um, but I just thought it was interesting from her perspective. Um, she said, uh, "In my experience, Rhode Island is slower than neighboring states to adopt energy efficiency with new construction. There are a few builders who are do doing amazing work, but they're not the norm. Luckily, we have one in the room here." Um, there's a group that she follows out of Colorado, the Green Builder Media, who does research on home buying trends, and they call their information cognition smart data. And according to their research, ESG, environmental social governance, um, is going to play a big part with Gen Z home purchasers, so the next generation of home buyers. Um, it already plays a part in their early adulthood shopping. She said she's a mother of a 22 and a 24 year old, so she knows this. And as their uh, generation saves up for money for houses, builders are going to wish they adopted sustainable and energy efficient practices sooner. It's not really a question in there, but I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, from her perspective as someone um, who has a real estate company um, and just get your reactions to that if you have one. No, I think that's that's validating. Um, it's great to hear. I think that that is, I mean, she's uh, mimicking what I think we're seeing in a, in a small way. So it's, I'm glad to, to know that she sees it as well. Yeah, I think as it relates to, you know, more labels, I think if homeowners, prospective buyers want to see the energy performance of building of homes that they're going to be purchasing, that will drive the real estate market to provide that. So I think that's, you know, if there's demand for it, we'll see, we'll see more realtors, uh, you know, providing that and, and being able to talk about, you know, home energy performance, and that will be a bigger part of these conversations. Great. So I know we're coming up on time. I think maybe we have time for one more question. If there's any other, any other ones out there lingering. No. All right. Well, again, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know our organizers have a, a few closing words. I almost forgot. So um, thank you guys very much. On the back table there, we're trying something new. So each of our speakers referenced. Um, a couple programs and reports. And so um, there are QR codes on those vertical vertical papers back there. If anyone's interested in digging in a little bit more to the ACEEE report, Hannah talked about um, the program <clears throat> that Jennifer talked about and John's work. You can access that information directly if you just take a picture of those QR codes. We also have um, annual reports in the back if you want to do some light reading. Um, and um, one other thing, 
that we, we want to make sure everyone understands is that in Rhode Island, we have an Energy Efficiency and Resource Management Council, which is um, kind of an amazing group of people, each of whom um, have a seat around the table because they represent a different sector of um, <clears throat> energy consumers. So um, they have actually um, co-sponsored this entire series. And um, one of the things that they like for us to make sure folks know is that you can participate in their process every month. Um, you can learn about energy efficiency policies and programs online on their website um, or also the state energy office's website. You can attend meetings. Uh, they're open always. You can attend them online or in person. Um, and then you're always welcome to make public comments. So they work, you know, to advise the annual plan that um, is approved that Rhode Island Energy makes. And this is a participatory process. You know, it, it, there are decisions that affect all of us. And so the ERMC welcomes your participation and your voice. Um, and we are very grateful to them for providing us with this opportunity to share this information with you here at URI. So thank you to those of you who come with and, and uh, join us every time we see you. Um, thanks to everybody at home. And if you're watching this later, um, thank you as well. We have one more lecture two weeks from today, um, Wednesday, October 18th. And it's a, it's a hot topic, one that I think more people are, are aware of. Um, we're calling the lecture Wired for the Future, Navigating the Push to Electrify Everything. Um, there's a lot wrapped up in that. And we have um, folks from Rewiring America, which is a, a really cool organization. You should Google them. Um, the Regulatory Assistance Project and Advanced Energy United speaking. Um, so please try to join us in person here two weeks from today, October 18th at 6 p.m. We will have hot cider and cheesecake brownies. Um, on behalf of Cooperative Extension and the Energy Efficiency and Resource Management Council, thank you very much. See you next time.